not much left for me after <laughs> this as a presentation, but fortunately I decided to do, sir. All right. Is it working then? All right. I'm going to do habitat light. <laughs> When the idea of my speaking at uh, today's event first uh, was suggested by uh, a, a dear friend and colleague, Lauren Lerner, um, she uh, suggested that I touch upon my professional and personal experience of Habitat 67, uh, my home for 15 years. Um, representation which is my first concern in, in my contribution, uh, stems from my years as curator, among other responsibilities, of Canadian Architecture Collection at Megan University, to which, in 1990, the archive of Moshe Safdie, one of the university's distinguished graduates, had been given. It was a gift with few precedents, a fact underlined by the circuitous manner in which the contents of the archive, consisting of more than 100,000 drawings, models, photographs, project files, and presentation boards, and representing the first 25 years of the architect's work, had been introduced across the US-Canada border. Ignorant as I was then of the finer ways of customs negotiations, I reacted with passionate incredulity to the suggestion of those well versed in the matter that I should simply declare it this much coveted archive as just so many tons of quote old paper, unquote. Yeah. With this unprepossessing beginning and a substantial grant from the SSHRC, our team at McGill, some of whom are represented in the audience, launched a three-year research and conservation project that was to inform much of my subsequent career and perhaps not surprisingly my life as well. In 1996, it was mentioned, Miguel Queen's University Press went on to publish the results of our work, Moshe Safdi, Buildings and Projects, 1967 to 1992. It was the first comprehensive account of the 115 projects designed by the architect and based on the Megal Archive. Contemporaneous with the early availability of the World War web, it had an online bibliography, a simple electronic catalog, and some nascent web pages were also present. 20 years later, from across the Atlantic, I remember those years as full of excitement and new experiences, and the archive as a true building site to which we sought to give form and purpose, order and meaning. Our methods may have differed from those of the architect and his office, but we were literally reconstructing and representing his projects and you. Habitat a now growth of Sardis undergraduate thesis and the first project to be realized by the architect was a natural departure point for all of our endeavors. It had been conceived, nurtured, and anchored at the university that was now tasked to care for his legacy. When the work began in 1992, Habitat was half the age it is today. Its conceptor, after many years of building elsewhere, had completed the new building of the National Gallery of Canada, the Demare wing of the Musée de Beaux-Arts de Montréal, and was engaged in the radical design and construction of the Vancouver Library. I believe that the energy of this project also borrowed our own. Sergei's memories of his childhood in Haifa as they appear in Beyond the Habitat and elsewhere. Recall the family hillside apartment home with its private entrance and a not so small menagerie, 
50 chickens, two goats, and a couple of beehives, of which he was the proud owner. It took imagination to follow those Mediterranean images, infused with years of study, travel, and close observation of housing patterns in Europe and North America, and to see them morph into Saudi's original scheme. Um, an A-frame, high-density, modular concept for a fully serviced community with its mixture of commercial, cultural, and residential facilities. It was bold, it was gigantic, and with the initial price tag of $42 million, which, uh, if my calculations are correct, would amount to about $380 million today, the government needed, deemed it unbuildable. The mixed-use concept popular today yielded to the residential block only, and even so, the original forecast of 950 housing units has to be scaled down to 158. The Saudi archive powerfully illustrates the controversies in text and image. The built scheme, or phase one as it was known, was erected on a privileged ground, a unique site overlooking the city on one side and the Expo Islands on the other. It was also an uncertain ground in the sense that the architect was applying here a wholly original building method for an entirely new structural form. Growing habitat material and generating a whole different environmental system in the process was the result of a continuing dialogue contributing to the development of his work and thought. An architectural legitimation of the 20th century building block, so dear to Le Corbusier and his followers, met here with a powerful antithesis in the generative environmental system devised by Saudi. Overlapping inspirations, hanging gardens of Babylon, the Baha'i gardens of Haifa, Mediterranean villages cozily clustered on a hill, metabolic theories by the post-war architects of Japan. All had seamlessly been transformed here into a new way of urban life with, for everyone, or almost everyone, a garden. The complex morphology of public spaces in habitat offers an, an analogy with the Eiffel Tower of the mythologies uh, by Roland Barthes, offering instant recognizability, simultaneous views of the city and from the city, a kaleidoscope of views, familiar yet ever-changing. Lacking the sleekness of a ship, uh, it still demonstrates some characteristics of a large naval vessel. Beyond its situation, at anchor in the Cité de Havre. Its pedestrian streets or walkways, internal bridges, the narrow functional kitchens, and modular bathrooms emphasize the highly structured yet evolving, private yet communicative approach to space. Various combinations and color schemes which were well shown in the kitchen photograph, made the repetitive look fresh, close attention to detail, broke up the mold of standardized units. Some of the dozen or so model interiors created at Habitat at the time of Expo might look sedate from today's viewpoint, and the archival images hide some of the protracted controversies that had set avant-garde against more acceptable commercial taste and the future-focused foreign against the Canadian-only design. In choosing the latter, the short-term effect may have been more modest, but in the long term, uh, under the guidance of uh, Jacques Guillaume and others, it led to a major boost 
for the Canadian design industry. I lived in Habitat for 15 years until my husband and I moved to London in 2004. The Habitat shuttle brought us to the gates of McGill and took us home every day. And when we got married, it ferried our guests for a Habitat reception. We watched the seasons change from our large window facing the city. We planted and we admired the more ambitious residents, zen and vegetable gardens, sunken living rooms, and the proliferation of solaria arching over the secondary terraces. We socialized at the spectacular rooftop firework parties, walked the park and the islands with our neighbors, but mainly, as Adolf Laws once said, we learned to dwell, to dwell in the city and enjoy a quality of life that we have missed ever since. The cartoons on the image before you uh, show well one aspect that is rarely mentioned, and that is the ludic quality of the habitat building. The, the, these uh, cartoons, of course, were contemporary to the uh, building itself. And uh, while humorous, and I think uh, uh, mischievous in part, they show how imagination had been spared by the uh, habitat building uh, itself. Uh, the, the, they and uh, the constant mediatization of the building, which uh, I must say has resurfaced uh, uh, again recently, uh, reinforced the habitat myth as a place like no other. Other contribution, uh, other contributing factors are temporal, and they stem from the uh, extraordinary youth of the Habitat team itself. Perhaps some of you recognize uh, some faces. And from the youth of its architect, and he shown here with his daughter Tao, uh, who today is a prominent uh, architect in California in her own right. Um, the, there are three generations of children who have experienced habitat. Of course, they, most of them are now uh, grown up. And as one of them, the journalist Blake Gottman, uh remarked recently in an article in the New York Times, for sheer sensory excitement, habitat could not and cannot be managed. As it reaches its 50th year, Habitat remains one of the uh, uh, most recognizable buildings of the 20th century. Uh, most recently, Canada issued a stamp in its honor uh, to, make, to mark the host of uh, this year's anniversaries. And it is only one of the six Canadian buildings included in the massive atlas of the 20th century architecture. Um, I wanted you to see uh, Habitat Israel project, which was the first uh, project after our Habitat uh, that uh, was proposed to be built. It uh, didn't come to fruition, but uh, as you all know, uh, Safdi uh, built some extraordinary uh, other projects uh, for Israel, including the community of Modayin, uh, the Hebrew Union College, uh, Yeshiva Porat Yosef, and of course, uh, probably most uh, uh, recognized uh, by all of us. Uh, the spectacular building of Yad Vashem. Um, Habitat of the future. It was said after Habitat Israel, uh, Habitat Puerto Rico, Habitat to Habitat New York uh, that were never built 
that the idea of habitat was dead. Um, there were reasons uh, uh, for it, political reasons, uh, economic reasons, because it came uh, uh, to considerably more than uh, uh, anticipated, but uh, and it didn't adapt itself uh, well enough to the various regional uh, variations. However, uh, the architect, for one, uh, for one, didn't uh, give up on the. Um, idea of habitat and uh, it brought to my mind the quote uh, by Jean Cocteau that poet is someone who builds and rebuilds myth in order to construct others always more real. The, this is true of architects and after all poetry and architecture have a common ground in the Greek uh, word poesis which uh, means making. Um, in the beginning of the new century, the Tsardi set up a laboratory in uh, his office, uh, which was to look at whether habitat in this day and age could exist, could exist appropriate to the age, could exist in another form, in another configuration, and um, in and explore high density living with all the amenities and comforts that uh, uh, the most of us got so easily used uh, to. Um, out of that came a host of projects that um, some of which. Uh, are uh, either being built in Singapore and China and elsewhere in Asia or are considered uh, for other locations. Uh, demographics uh, favors uh, high density living because in the time between Expo 67 and today we grew in population from 3.5 to 6.7 billion. Um, that's a lot of people uh, for whom to find a home. And the concentration of population in the cities uh, makes it worthwhile to explore the, the possibilities of making uh, a home or a house in the form which makes it amenable to uh, not a high-rise building, or possibly a high-rise building now, but uh, a building that offers the privacy, the fresh air, the sun, the uh, uh, pleasures of living and the quality of life that Habitat taught us all to appreciate. Do I have time, or am I? Two minutes. So I can't show you the, uh, the Marsha speaking on YouTube, but you can uh, take the link. Uh, that's uh, his introduction of the habitats stand at uh, Expo 67. But I wanted to say that uh, uh, I, for one, as a, not just as a former dweller, but principally as a architectural historian believe that uh, the habitat idea in a modified contemporary form is an idea still to come and I was greatly uh, heartened by reading um, in the New York Times that a current uh, project in Toronto uh, designed by uh, a Danish architect, uh, Ingels, uh, recalls the inspiration of Habitat and calls the proposed Toronto project Habitat II. So perhaps the Habitat is an idea yet to come. I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to take this opportunity to thank 
those in the audience who were part of the theme that uh, the team and the theme that uh, made uh, coming to terms with habitat possible. Thank you. Thank you.